Thank you. This is the first page of the first book that I ever read by myself. I was a student at the German School of Guatemala, here in the Guatemala City, and uh, I had just received a conical cardboard container, just like these. It's a tradition at German schools. And inside I found a new box of lead pencils, a sharpener, an eraser, some notebooks, and of course, my book, this book. Let me show it to you. My first book, which I've kept all these years. <laughs> so I loved my book. It smelled nice, it was mine, it was clean, it was new, it was, wow, I loved it. And uh, very soon, we went from reading single names, as in the first page, to this, and then to this, which is a story. I don't know how we got there so fast, but I was fascinated. The pictures, which I should have understood, were actually explained by the words, and it was magical. It was amazing, I loved it. From there, we moved on to the second book, which probably a lot of you used. This one may be familiar to some of you. Pepe y Polita. So this book had more stories and dialogues and more text and some pictures. And I know that by September, of 22nd of September, I was able to read this. So I was very happy and I was very glad that I had moved so fast, so far. I was hooked with reading. Then they organized, the teachers at the school organized a reading contest. And uh, we all had to read aloud passages from several books. The winners of this contest were taken to a room where there was a big table. And on the table, they had piled up books. And they told us, as a winner, you have the privilege of picking any book you like. And it will be yours. And I picked this book of prehistoric beasts which I still have, of course. So. <laughs> it's right here. It had a different smell from my previous book, but I loved it, and I can remember the smell, too. So, um, Many of you may be familiar with this set, too. My family was great. They gave me books, they encouraged my reading, and this is a set that had a little bit of everything. It's my first encyclopedia, written for children. Um, it had everything, science, technology, even magic tricks. And my favorite of the set was this one. Um, it talked about submarines and ships and the Panama Canal. I was fascinated. I didn't understand maybe what it had meant to build the Panama Canal, but I was impressed that people were working so long, so hard to do this. So this was an important book for me. Unfortunately, I don't have it anymore. But that's another story. Um, so my family, they were giving me access to their books, maybe 1,500 books in all. My grandparents, my uncles, my aunts. And my father would also buy books for me. Um, I remember reading this book and discussing it with my uncle. It was a lot of fun to do that. I loved it. And then, a few weeks ago, when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking about why my family was encouraging me so much, giving me all these books. And I, by, just by coincidence, I was wondering and about that, and I um, turned on the TV, and there was this movie on, The Princess Diaries. I don't know if any of you have watched it, um, but the basic argument is that Julie Andrews plays the queen of a little European country, and she's looking for her lost granddaughter, who has to take over the throne. So her granddaughter, till now, has been living in the US, and she doesn't know she's a princess at all. So Julie Andrews tells her, you are the princess of Genovia. And the girl says, me, a princess? But I've never led anybody. How can I do that? And Julie says, we will accept the challenge of helping you become the princess that you are. Oh, I can give you books. You will study languages, history, art, political science. Notice she didn't say you will read children's encyclopedias, or you will read novels for fun. Serious stuff. What's the reaction of a girl? Hmm. <laughs> Not really convinced, huh? Um, but what I found with reading was that some of these books were really hard, but I liked the challenge. 
And I had to because my family was asking me, did you read it? My grandfather would say, did you read the book I loaned lo lo to you? And there was some discussion and help. My mother, on the other hand, she was a practical person in the family. Here she is when she was, I don't know, three, four years old with her little uh, unicycle. And she would tell me, books, go, take your bicycle, go outside, live in the real world. Don't get stuck with books. You can read them later when you're older, but now enjoy life. And you know, at the time, this shocked me, but the more I think about it, the more I realize there's something important there. So I've always kept that in mind. So in high school, we read more serious books, maybe. Um, Lord of the Flies made a deep impression on me. But this is the book that I mostly remember from my high school years. Um, it's a novel, German novel from the post-war era. Uh, it's very dark and sad. And, uh, it talks about six characters living in an oppressed village, um, and they are trying to run away from there. But at the center of the story is this little statue of a monk. Now look at the monk, the way he's reading his book. He's totally immersed in the book. You can see that he's focusing on it. He's trying to understand it. But at the same time, there's a certain tension in him. You can see that maybe he's not just absorbing, he's thinking about it. And he's trying to decide by himself if this is something he wants to believe or not. Um, so this is the actual character that's at the center of the novel. And the characters in the novel try to save this one. So at the time, I was like, why do we have to read this dark novel? And uh, I don't really understand what's the point of this. But our professor, thank God, he was encouraging and he was making us think. This is a very important concept. And I've been spending all my life, I think, trying to follow up on this, trying to think by myself, to make my own mind up about the books I read. So um, I came to UFM and I studied engineering, uh, maybe 10,000 book library, um, but it had all the books that I needed for computer science, for really understanding what the discipline was all about. But then when I left for grad school and I went to the huge libraries, we're not talking a few thousand or 10,000 of books, we're talking millions of books, millions. What do you do there? Well, you browse and you are happy, and if you like books, this is amazing to be there. Um, but of course, I also knew that in Guatemala, we would probably, probably never have a library like this. 10 million volumes would easily cost $100 million. It's never going to happen in Guatemala. That's what I thought at the time. And also, the bookstores. When I left Guatemala and I went abroad and I saw all the bookstores, and I started buying books, used, new, and sending them home. Um, we finally posted this little note in my study. Home is where you keep your stuff while you're out there getting more stuff and sending it home. So very soon I had all these books that I had stored here at my mother's house. Um, in the end, I decided to go the full way and study librarianship. And I ended up managing um, the Learning Resource Center on this ship. It's called the Scholarship. It was a traveling university. And uh, we went around the world. And of course, any university needs a library. And the first thing to build a library is to have shelves. So let me tell you how you run a library in about three minutes. <laughs> you have shelves and you need books. So there was a consulting librarian. She ordered the books and she had them delivered to the ship. So that's a function that's called selection and acquisition. Now we have the books. We have to put them on the shelf. Well, they have to go on the shelf in a certain order. And if you've ever gone to a library and wrote down the number of the book and then looked for it on the shelf, you should know that that number is actually quite magical. It's a code for a portion of the universe of knowledge. So here are the books. Here's the stamp, very important. You have to stamp your book so that if somebody takes it, you will know where it's from. You don't just stamp it once, at least twice or maybe in three different places. Then you record the book in your list. You make an inventory. So we had a manual inventory, but we also entered it into the computer. And you put the right number on the spine so the book goes on the right place on the shelf. 
So that's what we were doing there. And uh, of course, this is a ship, it moves. So the shelves had this protective device so that the books wouldn't fall over all over the place. So now the library is ready for use and students come, they use it. Uh, we were at sea for sometimes seven days, 10 days at a time. And the books were used a lot. Our internet connection was really slow. Facebook was just getting started, but you couldn't really even use Facebook. It was so slow and expensive to use. So the books were a good alternative. We also had downloaded Wikipedia so the students had access to some reference sources. Of course, it was not enough to do research, but it was something. And the books got checked out. So we were circulating books, and people would use them for like identifying birds that they saw, and then they would bring them back. Sometimes the books can come back wet or damaged, and then we have to replace them, reorder them, and all of that has a big cost. So here's the check-in. Students worked in the library, and we would reshelve them, and that was the library. Now, notice that it was a ship, and uh, we did go through the Panama Canal, and at that time I was hoping, I was wishing I, I could have this book again with me, just to compare if what I had read so many years before was even close to the truth. Uh, we went through the Corte Culebra, um, which I couldn't understand when I read it in the book, but then when I saw it, it was amazing, and of course the locks, quite an amazing experience. But everything good comes to an end, they say. Um, unfortunately, the program ended after the first year, and uh, we had to pack up the library. But this gives you a nice life cycle for a library. We packed it up in boxes, and it was shipped off um, to Ghana, where it became part of the University of Ghana's collections. So, empty, empty shelves. That's what awaited me at home. Uh, my mother had packed, well, I had to help her pack all my books, and we had to get rid of many of them. Um, it was hard. I kept some, the ones that I considered important and special for me, but many I just gave away. I didn't have any more space for my growing collection of books. Um, librarians do the same thing. It's called weeding, you know, like you pull the weeds in a field, uh, we are weeding all the time in libraries. You get rid of the books that nobody is reading or that nobody wants or that are completely out of date, like this D-based programming book. Shelving space is a big issue for libraries. And uh, mass storage has been one of the solutions. So you still keep the books. You don't give them away. But if your library has two million books that nobody has used in the last 50 years, well, which can happen easily, then you put them in storage. University of Chicago came up with a great solution. They put them in storage under their campus so that you can get instant access to the books, but you have a beautiful reading room on top of that big underground storage. This is the underground storage where the books are. And it takes 20 minutes to retrieve them. Another solution is digitization. And this is one of the books that was digitized by Universidad de Marroquín. Um, it's very convenient. You digitize a book, you place it online, you don't have to ship it, to keep it on the shelves, and everybody can have access to it. Of course, if you want to get a book these days, you can always get the physical book, but you can also get a digital version. And if you look above the uh, that yellow button, it sends rent with one click. You can now rent books from Amazon. So you don't even have to keep the digital copy forever. It will disappear. It will die. You can even lend books online. So if you purchase some books, you can lend them or found, find books that you can lend. But if you're really nostalgic, you can even get online and buy that copy of uh, Count of Monte Cristo again in the original form, you know, the same edition. If you look for it, for stuff, you will find it eventually. But who wants to bother with physical things? Look for the free, legal um, copy that is available online in all the different formats that you may want. So books are digital. What's the future of libraries and uh, bookstores? Um, this is a picture I took at the New York airport in 2007. Borders and uh, this announcement on the wall, right? A new Sony reader coming your way, 
and boarders going about its business selling books, like always. All of these books are now available digitally, and Borders has closed. This is a picture I took last week in the Houston airport. Borders, borders bookstores have disappeared. Um, will the same happen to libraries? I'm sure. Libraries are sustained by their clients. And if you look at this, this is the uh, circulation, the times, and the number of books that have been checked out um, in average per person per year in the US since the year 1850. And it's, it has a tendency to go down. It's gone down from 20 to about six last year. Same thing is happening in academic libraries. Uh, from about 26 per person, maybe 15 years ago, to less than no, about 15. So there's a strong trend. People are not really using libraries that much. They're not checking out books that much. They may be using libraries for other things, but not to get the books. And this is very clear in, in science and technology libraries like this one. Um, science and technology libraries are getting rid of their books. Uh, Stanford University, they got rid of 70,000 books. They left only 10,000 on the shelves. And uh, this is the library where I work now at Effort University. It's an engineering college and we're building, yeah, I have to also learn how to read these <laughs> a little bit. Um, we're now designing a new library and it will have a museum that's a round shape and it will have lots of reading space, but very little space for shelves if you compare it to what libraries used to be like. So if librarians are maybe going to lose their jobs because all these libraries are going to be closing, uh, what are they gonna be doing? This is a quote that my husband loves. It's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, he says we should have professors of books. Well, maybe we should. Maybe librarians can become professors of books and guide us in finding worthwhile readings. Um, maybe librarians can go a step further and teach us through the books, like this very interesting um, idea that Stephenson has in this novel. Highly recommend it. I have a copy here if anybody wants to loan it, <laughs> to take it. Um, but what becomes of our shelves if we get rid of books? They become empty. They disappear. They no longer talk about us. They don't tell us who you are by the books, the company you keep. Or maybe we will, but we will display it in a different way, with different kinds of devices or lists online. But for me, what's important is, no matter what format the books take, if you look at this image, remember the monk reading the book? Well, there she is, reading a book on a Kindle. And I hope she's engaging all her imagination, her intelligence, her power of decision, to believe or not what's in the book, and to make the most, the best use of it that she can. And I also have an, a parting thought, and it is this, doesn't this, picture make you feel like you wish you could give her books or ebooks? Thank you. <laughs>